All right. Good evening. This is uh, MT, MT Clark, and this is my friend Peter James, and we are here for Bonhoeffer's Discipleship. Uh, it's going to be a, a class, uh, a course, an informal study of Bonhoeffer's The Cost of Discipleship. And um, basically tonight we're going to walk through or review uh, some of what Bonhoeffer had to say and, uh, in chapter one. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna kick it off. I I've created a PowerPoint presentation, and we're gonna go to go to that to share that screen as soon as I key it up to the sets. All right. Okay. And now I will share a screen. And here we are. All right. Um, we'll just move that. And we'll do that. Okay. So tonight, as I said, it's Bonhoeffer's Discipleship, uh, the cost of discipleship study. And if the animation works, this is lesson one, cheap grace, uh, based on ch chapter one. Uh, just a small note about our, our, our presentation, our study. Um, most of what you'll see tonight are Bonhoeffer's words right out of the book. So, I mean, there might be some paraphrases or whatnot, but I didn't put everything in quotes, but generally my slides uh, have the words of Bonhoeffer right from the, right from the text. Um, I didn't want to claim to, to have written any of this. Some of this stuff is, is my commentary on it, um, but for the most part, it's, it's the stuff I share is generally quotes uh, from, from the text. And uh, so, you know, who's Diedrich Bonhoeffer? You know, he's our author. You know, and um, I, our author is the pastor, martyr, prophet, and spy, as the Eric Metaxas biography is subtitled. And uh, if, if you want to know anything about um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's life, I would invite you and encourage you to get Metaxas's book, or like I did, listen to it on, on audible.com. Uh, um, but real some basics uh, about Bonhoeffer um, from Wikipedia, <laughs> as basic as you can get. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was born in 1906, on um, February 4th, and he died on April 9th, 1945. Uh, he, was, he was a German Lutheran pastor, theologian, anti-Nazi dissident, and key founding member of the Confessing Church in Germany. Uh, his writings on Christianity's role in the secular world have become widely influential in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. And there's a good friend of ours, Mike Thomas, dropping in, just so you know. <laughs> Sorry, I'm responding. Uh, we'll just say hello to Michael as he drops in, and there be, might be more of us uh, dropping in later. All right, Michael. Uh, good to see you, sir. We've we've begun our presentation, and uh, we'll just uh, you can listen in as we as we go. Uh, as I was saying, our, our author uh, bon, bon, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, uh, his writings on Christian on Christianity's role in the secular world have become widely influential. In his book, The Cost of Discipleship, is described as a modern classic, and thus that's why. I decided to do this this study for my podcast and for the YouTube channel. It's just because his his book was such an influential book in my Christian walk. Um, I consider it a classic, and and really, I haven't seen too many people go through the material. Uh, there's been a lot about Bonhoeffer and his life, but um, you know, basically tonight's focus is going to be on his words and theology. Um, as I try to fix the, so you can see his face. Uh, there are some cooler pictures of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer out there, but I, I decided to go with that one because he's a little older and that's a little more, you know, uh, less cool, uh, I guess. Um, <laughs> but, but we go with that one. Um, he was known for his staunch resistance to the Nazi dic dictatorship, including vocal opposition uh, uh, to Hitler's euthanasia program and genocidal persecution of the Jews. He was arrested and imprisoned in 1943 for conspiring to rescue Jews, and he was later accused of being associated with the July 20th, 1944 plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. 
Um, he was, like I said, he was in prison and he was later sent to Flossenburg concentration camp, camp where he was hanged um, on April 9th, uh, 1945. And from what I can recall from the details of his life, uh, that's probably like less than a month or within a, a little bit more than a month that the, uh, that the, um, the, the concentration camp was liberated. So it's somewhat tragic. Um, and tonight, like I said, basically tonight's, we're gonna hi highlight his words and here are some of his words uh, on his first, from his first chapter, Cheap Grace. And it says, Cheap Grace means grace as doctrine, as principle, as system. It means forgiveness of sins as a general truth. It means God's love is merely a Christian idea of God. Those who affirm it have already had their sins forgiven. The church that teaches this doctrine of grace thereby confers such grace upon itself. The world finds in this church a cheap cover-up for its sins, for which it shows no remorse, and from which it has even less desire to be set free. So I write uh, that cheap grace, you know, according to Bonhoeffer's quote, it's, it's sort of unlimited. It's uncon unconditional. Uh, it's without a cost. Um, now, uh, that's cheap grace. Now, just, just to be clear, um, I recently taught a, a class on, on God's grace, and we define God's grace as his divine favor. And, and, and cheap grace is just a perversion of God's grace, which, you know, not for nothing, is a little confusing because God does forgive us of our sins. Um, we are unlimitedly forgiven. Um, but there is a cost and there's an expectation in, in poor Christian discipleship. And that's what the book's on, the cost of discipleship. And that's the focus we're taking at it from, uh, from a discipleship principle, um, basically, because we don't want to take anything away from grace. Uh, it is amazing and it can be abused. Um, so, but the thing is, if you, if you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you're not going to abuse God's grace. Um, you're gonna you're gonna fall in love with the Father uh, for rescuing you from your from your your fate of being separated from Him and facing God's wrath to the point where you will obey and you will follow uh, the Lord uh, with your life instead of trying to take advantage of, of of grace by living a life of sin. So, but cheap grace would say, "Hey, it's don't worry, it's unlimited, it's unconditional, it's without a cost." And thus, it can be abused. Um, it can be taken advantage of and wasted. Um, and it can be antinomian, which is anti-law. So people prescribed a cheap grace, you know, don't want to hear anything about the commandments, don't want to hear anything about fruit. Um, they just want to sit and uh, enjoy the forgiveness that comes and keeps on coming, no matter how bad and dirty or broken my life is. Um, and whether or not, you know, um, you know, licentiousness, you know, the Bible indicates that license and licentiousness will not be um, uh, rewarded um, and covered uh, just because you made a profession of faith in Christ um, and then lived a life of sin. Um, scariest, for, you know, scariest parts in the Bible point out that Jesus tells people who claim to be Christians that uh, he, to, to depart from him, he never knew them because of they practice lawlessness. Um, so, so, and uh, the, this quote by Bonhoeffer also points out that, like it's a, uh, this cheap grace is like a system, a church that, that teaches this doctrine thereby confers such grace upon itself, like this church can do nothing wrong. Um, it's more or less an ideological carte blanche for sin without repentance. You can sin all you want, and you don't have to try to repent of your sin. Although the Bible would indicate, you know, we are to turn uh, from our, our ways of darkness and abstain from evil and do good. Um, another Bonhoeffer quote we share here is, cheap grace is the mortal enemy of our church our struggle today is for costly grace um, 
Let me just see. Oh, my bad. <laughs> there we go. I just wanted to stop the sharing for a second just to confirm I was recording. Talk about freaking out. Um, and I am. So that's good to know. As I said, this is not, this is an informal study. It's not professionally produced. And I'm running the uh, controls by myself. And I panicked for a second there uh, because I'm like, am I even recording this? And I am. Um, so there we go. Um, <laughs> cheap grace is the mortal enemy of our church. Our struggle today is for costly grace. Bonhoeffer wrote that uh, in 1937. And I believe that's the truth uh, for Christianity today. It's our struggle is against uh, cheap grace. And uh, we, want, we want what is known as costly grace to appreciate it, appreciate the cost. And we move along. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's just a copy of that. And in Bonhoeffer's day, chief grace was cultural Christianity. Uh, it was a, a system of denominationalism. Um, uh, uh, it was nominal faith. Everybody was Christian. Uh, you know, the vast majority. I, I don't have the exact numbers from 1937, but it was upwards of 90 percent and higher that people proclaimed to have a. Uh, 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 a belief in the Christian faith, uh, at least in the United States. Um, and so if you have numbers that high, you have to wonder about uh, the sincerity of people's faith. Um, it was a cultural institution of Christianity. There was uh, stark divisions between Protestants and Catholics, and to the point where I've, I've heard tale of Protestant neighborhoods versus Catholic neighborhoods, and that the two, the two, the two halves of uh, Christianity didn't get together. Um, it was somewhat contentious. Uh, there was social control. Uh, people were encouraged to be Christian. Christian business, you know, business deals were done at church. Um, you know, it was it was a part of uh, the fabric of society in Bonhoeffer's time. But there were secret sins, and there were. Um, you know, at, this was around the time Freud and the sexual theories came out, and this is after the Roaring Twenties, World War One, and after Depression hits and Hitler's coming to the rise. Um, there's subtle rebellion, but underneath, uh, underneath, because um, uh, everyone, everyone's quote unquote, everyone's Christian, um, and. Some people are sinners, but they're certainly not out and about about it if they proclaim to be part of that that church. Um, so the subtle rebellion um, leads to another world war. Um, so that was cheap grace in Bonhoeffer's day. And and guess what? We still have cheap grace today in the 21st century. Um, uh, I, the picture I share is from Joel Osteen's church in Houston. Um, and uh, your best life now. Um, I actually was a fan of Joe Olstein early in my in my faith, and I would say, um, you know, he Joel preaches from the Word of God. Um, he he does a he does a prayer at the end of every service to tell people to make Jesus their Lord and Savior. And I honestly believe if you if you make a profession of faith sincerely through Joe Olstein, you'll be saved. Um, of course, it's not in Joel Stein, it's in Jesus Christ, but in, in today's society, you have to start somewhere. Um, if anything, and the rise of the mega churches and the denominational decline is because of those old traditional churches, the liturgical churches uh, have fallen out of vogue, um, and, and these new mega churches with lively worship have become very popular. And um, and it's it's sort of a response to the the dried up uh, religion of of liturgical churches. It's one of the one of the complaints um, of why there's so many non denominational churches now. I belong to a denominational church, um, a spirit filled one. But you know, it's um, it's 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 sort of today's cheap grace um, consumerism so many i mean that's a huge stadium filled with believers uh i i would imagine i would imagine and it's a message that goes out um so the relationship between 
the the mega church pastor and his and his flock is somewhat distanced. Um, and now after COVID, we have online churches and online streaming and almost every church that's available. Um, what else do we have? So we have everything from, from the denominational days of, of, you know, the mix of true believers and, and false. Um, we have the rise of mega churches. Uh, we have churches and cults that affirm two sources of truth, just like we did back then. Uh, the Catholic Church has church tradition in the Bible. Um, Mormons have their own books. Jehovah's Witnesses have theirs. And then there's universalist churches that bring in all types of different uh, uh, faith systems, basically. Um, you know, however you feel about it one way or another, the Bible sort of indicates that female pastors are sort of not the thing, uh, but there are female pastors and priests these days, which back in Bonhoeffer's day wasn't a thing. That's why we pointed out, I'm not here to cause controversy, just making observations. There are literally gay churches out there. There are gay affirming churches. Um, if you do a Google search for gay churches, you'll find some. Um, so I'm not making that up. I'm just pointing out what's here in the 21st century that definitely was not alive and well in the day of Bonhoeffer. Um, so the critical theory. If you don't know what critical theory is, it's basically sort of Marxism, um, where it says oppressed people uh, there's a whole heart uh, uh people are judged by their group and your designation in a group and unfortunately certain movements uh, uh like uh, black life black 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 lives matters their manifesto is sort of based in critical race theory and it, it would say that um uh that reparations are needed, people are guilty of their ancestors' sins, um, and that we're going to be judged not by the content of our character, as Martin Luther King wanted in his, in his I Had a Dream speech, but by your, by your group. Um, so there's churches that have, have, haven't have really, uh, in such a response to um, the claims of racism, um, have embraced critical theory um, systems, basically, without realizing it's sort of anti-Christ. Um, again, <laughs> examine it for yourself. That's, we're not doing a, a study on these things. These are things that are alive and well today that really weren't around in Bonhoeffer's day, although communism was, and we've seen what happened to communism. Um, and of course, there's greasy grace. There's ultra grace, and there's licentiousness. Um, like I said, that the contrast here, pointing that out, is that um, I get the impression in 1937 people hid their sin, whereas now it's out in the public square um, and there's much confusion and and pride uh, in people's sins. Uh, there's legalization of recreational drugs that certainly wasn't around in Bonhoeffer's day. So if you claim to be Christian and 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 are a part of the modern culture, you're going to be really a practicer of cheap grace to cover all this stuff that uh, traditional biblical Christianity would, would basically frown upon. So we move along. <laughs> so cheap grace is the death of Christian discipleship. And that's the point here. We're doing a study of Bonhoeffer's book, uh, The Cost of Discipleship. So our focus is on discipleship. And Bonhoeffer writes, cheap grace is thus the denial of God's living word, denial of the incarnation of the word of God, which is Jesus. Uh, cheap grace means justification of sin, but not of the sinner. Um, uh, and I, I share some bit, uh, Bible references there for the scariest verses in the Bible. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Uh, depart from me, I never knew you because you practice lawlessness. And Luke 13, 24, 28, where people claim to just have a loose association with Jesus and they get the same message, um, which I, I, I love those uh, passages in scripture because it shows that, you know, your good works without a, without a true heart for Christ aren't going to do it and your loose association of, yeah, I'm here. Uh, I sat I sat and heard them talk about Jesus one time. Uh, that's not going to be enough either. If 
if indeed you're you're not in the faith. Um, because grace alone, and, and we continue with Bonhoeffer's quotes, because grace alone does everything, everything stay can stay in its old ways. Our action is in vain, which was actually a, a quote from uh, Martin Luther. Uh, the world remains world and we remain sinners, even the best of even in the best of lives. Um, I'll, I'll say more about that after I finish. Thus, the Christian should live the same way the world does. This is, of course, what Chief Grace says. Um, Martin Luther, uh, well, we'll get into Martin Luther a little bit later. Let's move along. Let's see. Um, Chief Grace equals Christianity without repentance. Um, and all, because we're forgiven, uh, I should just read his quotes. And all things the Christian should go along with the world, not venture like 16th century enthusiasts to live a life, a different life under grace from that of under sin. The Christian better not rage against grace or defile that glorious cheap grace by proclaiming anew a servitude to the letter of the Bible and an attempt to live an obedient life under the commandments of Jesus Christ. Um, yeah. Uh, basically, the uh, 16th century enthusiasts were, were, were believers that believed with a deep internal faith, uh, somewhat reverent, silent faith, and sort of separation from the world. Um, they believed in uh, really the, the belief in faith and the practice of, of following the Lord. Um, and so proponents of cheap grace put those people up as straw straw dogs of legalism basically to uh to to you know uh discourage discipleship uh, or repentance and um and as Bonhoeffer writes here um you know you better not rage against that grace and just sort of not not come under that letter of the bible and attempt to live an obedient life under the commandments of Jesus Christ you know you know, as I write here, get your Bible off of my grace. Um, you know, basically, cheap grace discourages biblical Christianity, discourages discipleship, Christian living, Christian worldview, and evangelism. Cheap grace encourages secularization, be like everybody else, tolerate uh, tolerance, which is the, you know, basically tolerate the guy who sins a bunch because he's here in church with us. And so we know he's forgiven and everything's okay. Um, we can coexist with people who who are living uh, have a loose association with um, Christianity and with anyone else in the world. Um, it, it will cheap grace encourages nominalism. Yeah, I'll just say you're just say you believe and you're covered, or to universalism. Basically, everybody's saved. The grace the grace of God is so amazing it covers people who don't even believe it. And in this 21st century, um, I believe, I don't, you know, you can Google it, but the Pope indicates that atheists will be saved, um, people who don't even believe in God, um, because God is so amazing in his grace that um, you don't even have to believe and you'll be saved. Um, forgive me, Pope, if I speak out of context, but, but I saw it on, online, so it's got to be true. I'm saying that tongue in cheek, of course. And, and it encourages ignorance, immaturity, and licentiousness. Because your grace is a grace, the cheap grace covers all our sins, why would we ever repent? We don't need to change. We're forgiven. Um, we don't need to read the Bible because we have, we have the blood of Christ to cover us, and we don't need to know anything about it. We don't need to grow. We just come to church when we feel like it, um, tip a hat maybe give a few dollars and go about our merry way covered by God's amazing grace. Um, and I write, but unlike 16th century enthusiasts who, who as a general term had a focus on separatism and individuals internal and emotional conditions of faith. Just think of like that really devout guy praying very hard. You know, that was like the enthusiast, you know, it's got the faith's got to be in your heart um, to those emotional conditions of faith to empower God to work, cheap grace would reduce Christianity to nothing more than a meaningless preference of faith without change or evangelism. Cheap grace discourages repentance and classifies any attempt at sanctification or pursuit of maturity as legalism. Uh, that's not Bonhoeffer, that's me. Um, 
yeah, like I said, you know, um, uh, when I say follow the Lord, people would say, why, why would I do that? Uh, I'm forgiven. Um, are you trying to make me, are you a legalist? Are you trying to tell me to keep the law? I'm telling you to follow Christ or encourage you to, hey, uh, it's your walk, walk it out. Anyway, we move along. Um, Bonhoeffer writes, the world is justified by grace. Therefore, because this grace is so serious, because this irreplaceable grace should not be opposed, the Christian should live just like the rest of the world. Of course, a Christian would like to do something exceptional. Undoubtedly, it must be the most difficult renunciation not to do so and to live like the world. But the Christian has to do it, has to practice such self-denial so that there is no difference between Christian life and worldly life. This is obviously, uh, you know, uh, a stance on cheap grace, saying that God's grace is so amazing that we as Christians have to really fight the urge to, you know, to follow the, the letter of the law or follow God um, because we don't want to discourage anyone from joining in on the grace train. Um, as I write in tongue in cheek, of course I sin. We Christians are no better or any different from the world. We just know how to be forgiven. Just believe, brother, and do what you want. It's all been paid for. Um, yikes. That's unfortunately, I, you know, I'm really familiar with this because when I first got saved, I didn't know anything about um, the Bible. I just heard a message of, of God's love and um, I was very ignorant and immature. And I thought basically that's great. I can put my faith in Jesus and sin all I want. And thank God he's got to accept me because I said a prayer to make Jesus my savior. And now I can continue in my life of sin. So believe me, <laughs> if anyone's sympathetic to people who are very excited about grace, um, I am. But um, the word of God indicates that it's, it's not a license to sin. Um, as, as Paul says, should we go on in sin that grace may abound? God, God forbid, you know, is basically what Paul says. Uh, in the eyes of cheap grace, the abandonment of biblical principles for living demonstrate the hard road of truly understanding grace. No legalism here. And uh, so, so, so there you go. That's me. Um, and here are some things I, I basically threw out of uh, Bonhoeffer's text. Nothing to do. And this is Bonhoeffer. The Christian has, has to let grace truly be grace enough so that the world does not lose faith in this cheap grace. And being worldly, however, in this necessary renunciation required for the sake of the world, no, for the sake of grace, the Christian can be com comforted and secure in possession of that grace, which takes care of everything by itself. There's no one to follow. Uh, so the Christian need not follow Christ, since the Christian is comforted by grace, that is cheap grace as justification of sin, but not justification of the contrite sinner who turns away from sin and repents. It is not forgiveness of sin which separates those who sin from sin. Cheap grace is that grace which we bestow on ourselves. So they are not, nothing to follow, nothing to repent of. And then I write, nothing to confess. Cheap grace is preaching forgiveness without repentance. It is baptism without the discipline of community. It is the Lord's Supper without confession of sin. It is absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without living, the living incarnate Jesus Christ. And that's what he talks about, you know, Bonhoeffer's putting forth here that grace becomes its own thing, um, separated from Jesus Christ, that it's just a, a doctrine of, of, of forgiveness that requires nothing, nothing at all, uh, but, but saying yes to it. Um, let's see. Uh, what about the cost Christ paid for this cheap grace? What is costly grace? Uh, costly grace, according to Bonhoeffer, is the hidden treasure in the field for the sake of, of which people go and sell with joy everything they have. It is Christ's sovereignty for the sake of which you tear out an eye 
if it causes you to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ which causes a disciple to leave his nets and follow him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which has to be asked for, the door at which one has to knock. It is costly because it calls to discipleship. It is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs people their lives. It is grace because it therefore thereby makes them live. It is costly because it condemns sin. It is grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, grace is costly because it was costly to God, because it cost God the life of God's son. You were bought with a price. And because nothing can be cheap to us, which is costly to God, above all, it is grace because the life of God's son was not too costly for God to give in order to make us live. God did indeed give him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. And we continue. Costly grace is grace as God's holy treasure, which must be protected from the world, which must be not thrown to the dogs. Thus, it is a grace as living word, word of God, which God speaks as God pleases. It comes to us as a gracious call to follow Jesus. It comes as a forgiving word to the fearful spirit and the broken heart. Grace is costly because it forces people under the yoke of following Jesus Christ. It is grace when Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Costly grace is a relationship with God and a new life of repentance and peace. Um, costly grace resonates with our hearts that weep over the thought that Jesus would die for us. Costly grace calls us to follow the one who saved us. Costly grace calls us to be to, to crucify the flesh and to die to our previous life before Jesus, uh, before Christ. Costly grace causes us, causes us to love much the one who forgave much and to obey him because of our love for him. And so th those are my sentiments there on costly grace. Um, and uh, when you understand God's grace, it, it results in our surrender to it and his will. Um, yeah. Bonhoeffer's examples of those who found costly grace. Uh, we have two great examples in the, the apostle Peter, who here is uh, fighting to stay above the waves uh, as he walks on the water, and a portrait of Martin Luther, uh, the reformer. Uh, so those are the examples, and we'll go through those. Let's see. The Apostle Peter. Well, um, Peter is sort of as a, a before and after story. Um, Peter was basically Satan's plaything. He has a lot of ups and downs in his walk. Um, he, in Luke 5, one of the mess first messages I ever preached on, um, <laughs> um, Peter's in the boat with Jesus, and he turns, after he realizes who's sitting in the boat with, um, when he realizes that this is not just some guy, this is the, the Son of God, um, this is the Messiah I'm sitting with, it. this is a holy man, he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Um, later, uh, you know, and there's, I love the duality here because he answers Christ's call, but he was a sinful man. Um, he proclaimed Jesus as Messiah at Caesarea Philippi. Um, but right after that, he's rebuked by Christ for saying, when Christ tells of his, his oncoming death and resurrection, um, he says, depart from me, Satan, uh, to Peter. Um, Peter's a man of violence. And the, when they tried to detain Christ and arrest him, he cut someone's ear off. Um, and then he ran away. He was, a, he was a coward and he denied Christ three times. Not exactly the greatest hits for somebody who's going to be a follower of Christ. However, he followed Christ on the waves uh, and up, the, up to the mountain transfiguration. Um, he studied the word to be approved. Uh, which is shown in his in, in his in his on the day of Pentecost in his uh, in his his 
his speech that brought 3,000 people into the church. It was, uh, it was, it was a disposition on scripture and uh, of, of the Old Testament and the fulfillment that's found in Jesus. Um, he was redeemed. Uh, he was the redeemed Pentecost preacher who fed the sheep and who feeds the sheep and builds the church. Um, so the before and after of uh, costly grace is, is shown in, in Peter. Uh, so let's see, let's go, let's see. Yes, okay, here we go. Um, some quotes from the book. Uh, the same message is proclaimed to Peter three times, the message of costly grace. Um, at the beginning, at the end, and in Caesarea Philippi, namely that Christ is Lord and God. It is the same grace of Christ which summons him, follow me. The same grace also reveals itself to him in his confessing the Son of God. Grace visited Peter three times along his life's path. It was the one grace, but proclaimed differently three times. Thus it was Christ, Christ's own grace, and surely not grace with the disciple conferred on himself. It was the same grace of Christ which won Peter over to leave everything to follow him, which brought about Peter's confession, which had to seem like blasphemy to all the world, and which called the unfaithful Peter into the ultimate community of martyrdom, and in doing so forgave him all his sins. In Peter's life, grace and discipleship belong inseparably together. He received costly grace. And yeah, uh, so obviously Peter's a, a wonderful example of someone who's received costly grace, who, who repented of his sins, uh, who, who picked up his cross and followed Christ to the end of his life, uh, proclaiming the gospel as he went building the church. But costly grace was lost. Um, the, the expansion of Christianity, this is Bonhoeffer's words, the expansion of Christianity and the increasing secularization of the church caused the awareness of costly grace to be gradually lost. The world was Christianized. Grace became a common property of a Christian world. It could ha be had cheaply. And uh, let's see, we'll move along. Um, of course, even, even in those times, it was recognized that, that costly grace was being lost. And so there was a response, monasticism. Uh, the well-intentioned response results in spiritual materialism, personal achievement, works, and pride. Um, so, so in response to the fact that everyone was coming into the world, uh, of Christianity, everyone was being made Christian as a cultural institution, and where where the liturgical church was set up, and people would just go to church and not necessarily even know what was going on in Latin masses. Um, even the priests, in some cases, didn't know what they were even saying. They just memorized the words and didn't know the content of the words they spoke and didn't lead uh, holy lives. Um, in that culture, uh, there was a response that people really wanted to follow Christ. And thus, um, the, the Catholic Church developed uh, the monastic system uh, for those, those people that really felt called to follow the Lord, but didn't necessarily um, want to become a priest. Um, so there was religious orders of monks set up all over the place, and people went there. So if you really wanted to follow the way of, of Jesus Christ, you can go to the monastery or the nunnery. Um, the convent um, for those spiritual superstars who wanted to practice what they preached. Unfortunately, uh, <laughs> it was more or less a, a, another another worldly uh, way to, to corrupt uh, to corrupt the gospel of grace by making it uh, about our works. Um, I'm really holy, so I'm going to go to a monastery. Look at me. And so it came spiritual materialism, as I say. Uh, Bonhoeffer comments, but the decisive mistake of monasticism was not that it followed the grace-laden path of strict discipleship, even with all of, all of monasticism's misunderstandings of the contents of the will of Jesus, 
Rather, the mistake was that monasticism essentially distanced itself from what is Christian by permitting its way to become the extraordinary achievement of a few, thereby claiming a special meritoriousness for itself. So yeah, they were very special. Um, and thus, this is where Martin Luther comes into the picture, quite literally. Um, he, he, he gets, uh, Martin Luther's biography tells you about his, his moment of truth when he was frightened in a lightning storm, that he was going to be killed by lightning, stricken down by God, and he, he, he swears by a saint uh, that if, he, if he's not killed, that he will join the mon monastery, he will follow, he'll give up his, his worldly life of being a lawyer and um, basically become a monk. And he does become a monk. And so it's into this system of, of, of works righteousness um, that Martin Luther goes into and really wants to excel at. Um, but the problem was his heart really was to be perfect, meaning to try to be sinless and to be repentant for every, every ill thought or ill mistake that he would make. And thus he was a failure. Uh, he was he was a sinful man, as he would tell everybody, um, and, and he tried to be religious and penitent, and he couldn't keep the rules um, in his heart. He knew his thoughts. He knew he was, you know, he, he knew that he wasn't holy inside, um, that he wasn't perfect like he thought he should be, and, 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 and then he was disillusioned. Um, Basically, he went until, you know, he was a real problem in the monastery. So they sort of got him out of there and sent him on pilgrimage to Rome, uh, where, he, where he saw just how licentious the quote unquote church was and how corrupt, uh, where there was uh, corruption and, and sin in the church uh, there. And there was relics and all these, all, these, all these things that just seemed incorrect, including indulgences where people would pay. Uh, to get their relatives out of purgatory. Um, and they, they eventually made him an academic because he was a smart guy. They, they gave one of them to become a Bible teacher, a Bible scholar um, to teach the Bible. And that's what he did. And it is in that context where, um, where he basically became uh, a, a teacher of the word and discovered the Greek the original Greek translations of the uh, the Latin Vulgate, where uh, the word penitent was actually repentance. And when he understood that uh, it wasn't about paying for it uh, to be pen penitent, but about repentance and faith, faith would save um, is when everything changed. His 95 Theses was a challenge to the church to reform. Uh, to change the ways they were going, and a reformation started when he refused to, to disagree with scripture. Uh, out of darkness came light, um, as, the, as the reformer's uh, slogan said. You know, repentance created a reformation where there were the five solas of grace alone, by faith alone, and Christ alone, and scripture alone, for God's glory alone. And so Martin Luther you know, understood costly grace. He rediscovered it and he, he set the world on fire. Um, and to this day, it still needs to wake up uh, to God's amazing grace. Let's see here, we'll go to the next. And, and Martin writes, or well, not Martin, but uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes, during the Reformation, God reawakened the gospel of pure costly grace through God's servant, Martin Luther by leading him through the monastery. Luther was a monk. He had left everything and wanted to follow Christ in complete obedience. He renounced the world and turned to Christian works. He learned obedience to Christ and his church because he knew that only though those who are obedient can believe. Luther invested his whole life in his call to the monastery. It was God who caused Luther to fail on that path. God showed him through scripture that discipleship is not the meritorious achievement of individuals, but a divine commandment to all Christians. Luther saw the monks escape from the world as really a subtle love of the world. 
and this shattering of his last possibility to achieve a pious life, grace seized Luther. And the collapse of the monastic world, he saw God's saving hand reaching out in Christ. He seized it in the faith that our deeds are in vain, even in the best life. So he understood that our works couldn't save us. It was through grace alone and faith alone that we could be saved. And he goes on to write, it was a costly grace which gave itself to him. It shattered his whole existence. Once again, he had to leave his nets and follow. The first time when he entered the monastery, he left everything behind except himself, his pious self. This time, even that was taken from him. He followed not by his own merit, but by God's grace. He was not told, yes, you have sinned. Now all that is forgiven. Continue on where you were and comfort yourself with forgiveness. Luther had to leave the monastery and re-enter the world, not because the world itself was good and holy, but because even the monastery was nothing else but world. Luther's path out of the monastery back to the world meant the sharpest attack that had been launched on the world since early Christianity. The rejection which the monk had given the world was child's play compared to the rejection that the world endured through his returning to it. This time, the attack was a frontal assault. Following Jesus now had to be lived out in the midst of the world. What had been practiced in the special, easy, easier circumstances of monastic life as a special accomplishment now had become what was necessary and commanded for every Christian in the world. Complete obedience to Jesus' commandments had to be carried out in the daily world of work. This deepened the conflict between the life of Christians and the life of the world in an unforeseeable way. The Christian had closed in on the world. It was hand-to-hand -hand combat. And uh, out, of, out of that, um, you know, when, when, when Martin Luther understood, you know, that his, 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 his works would never save him, and that eventually along the lines, either through omission or commission or not doing what is good, we will always sin. Um, so thus, we sin. And, and so he would, you know, the, the, the slogan, sin boldly, uh, was, was, uh, was something that uh, Martin Luther had said um, to those who were trying to earn their salvation. Um, so to understand the grace of God, um, he would say, yeah, your, your works will never do it. Um, the grace of God covers your sin. Um, so, so if it helps you to understand God's grace, sin boldly because God has forgiven it. But it is only through, you know, someone who's, who's struggled and tried to live a righteous life in their own works that they could understand uh, the nuance to uh, 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 Mar Martin Luther's uh, comment to sin boldly. Uh, it's, it's the result of a fruitless search you know, rather than a presupposed concept of contempt, as I write here. The examples I pull from scriptures to sort of, you know, give you a parallel here is uh, the thief on the cross, who obviously was at the end of his rope and needed the grace of God to be saved. And in a moment, he received grace and just before he died uh, on the cross. So he certainly understood that uh, no matter what he did, you know, he was, he was not going to be approved, but through the grace of God, through Jesus Christ, he could receive the salvation and was given assurance of it right there on the cross. And of course, we, we parallel that with what Martin Luther does a great disposition on, uh, exposition on uh, the rich young ruler, Matthew 19, 16 through 30, um, who claims to have kept the, uh, kept the law perfectly all as you. And um, Christ raises the bar um, by saying to sell everything and follow me. And, you know, a lot of people focus on the sell everything part, but I focus on the follow me part. <laughs> um, you know, in order to follow Jesus, you know, in that day and time, uh, it would have been necessary basically to uh, abandon everything as his, as his disciples did. 
uh, so we move along. You know, grace, you know, is an end to seek God, not a beginning to end the search, you know, as I put, um, you know, as, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll share the quotes here. Uh, it was a, a conclusion for him, Luther, although a divine conclusion, not a human one. His descendants made this conclusion into a principled pre presupposition on which to base their calculations. That was the whole trouble. If grace is the result given by Christ himself to Christian life, then this life is not for one moment excused from discipleship. Ultra grace, I will sin boldly. You know, um, yikes. Um, but, as Bonhoeffer writes, but, but if grace is a principled presupposition of my Christian life, then in advance, I have justification of whatever sins I commit in my life in the world. I can now sin on the basis of this grace. The world is in principle justified by grace. I can thus remain as before in my bourgeoisie secular existence. Everything remains as before, and I can be sure that God's grace takes care of me. And um, so there you go. It's like, oh, this is grace, you know, without without a without a conviction of sin. Um, oh, everything I do is forgiven. Great, uh, you know, that's the pre supposition. Whereas, whereas with Luther's journey, trying his hardest to be holy in his own strength, to follow and obey the commandments, to you know, flagellate himself into obedience and, and into holiness was a fruitless search and and that grace you know came in and, and showed him that he was approved and all it did was cause him to seek the lord more um, whereas if we're just accepting god's grace at face value without a search without without a conviction of your sin um, you'll just take it as a principle and go about living your life just before you ever heard about Jesus and, 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 and the doctrines of your race. Um, so obviously we're pointing towards discipleship here. And I write, knowledge by experience, the way in which it is obtained is perhaps more significant than the intellectual content of the knowledge, how you learn something. You know, uh, how you learn something is sometimes, you know, uh, you know, uh, instrumental in what you learn. Uh, my example is a hot stove, not good, uh, is more meaningful to those who have had the experience of being badly burned more than those who can intellectually understand the concept of being burnt or who came close to being burnt. You know, grace found after searching and brokenness versus someone taught in Sunday school, you know, something's taught to Sunday, to, uh, in Sunday school to children, you know, um, grace found after searching and brokenness, you know, it's heartfelt, it's experiential, it's spirit empowered grace, a grace that knows the cost versus a grace as a matter of course or a theory. Um, and Bonhoeffer writes, I am liberated from following Jesus by cheap grace, uh, which has the has to be the bitterest enemy of discipleship, which has to hate and despise true discipleship. You know, grace as presupposition is grace at its cheapest. Grace as a conclusion is costly grace, you know, something we finally arrive at. It is appalling to see what is at stake in the way in which a gospel truth is expressed and used. It is the same word for the justification by grace alone, and yet false use of the same statement can lead to the complete destruction of his essence. Um, the false use uh, of grace. Um, bon, uh, Bonhoeffer writes, when Foss says at the end of his life of seeking knowledge, I see that we can know nothing, then that is a conclusion, a result. It is something entirely different when a student repeats this statement in the first semester to justify his laziness, according to Kierkegaard. Uh, used as a conclusion, the sentence is true. As a presupposition, it's self-deception. And, and there you have it. And, and Faust actually, you know, basically was a scholar. He wanted to know everything. And, and, you know, everything in his library of books or whatever didn't give him knowledge. 
And uh, in that story, uh, he actually turns to occult practices and has an encounter with the devil. Um, so we have to be careful uh, in our search, what we find and how we pursue it. Um, and the example here is perfect. I mean, any, 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 anyone can say, you know, we can't know anything and then thus not study. Um, you know, as a conclusion, you know, that's, that's a profound statement. As a as a presupposition, it's just laziness or self deception, as Bainhoffer says. Uh, grace is a call to discipleship, um, and here's Bonhoeffer's words: uh, "That means that knowledge cannot be separated from the existence in which it was acquired. Only those who, in following Christ, leave everything they have, can stand and say that they are they are justified solely by grace." They recognize the call to discipleship itself as grace and grace as that call. But those who want to use this grace to excuse themselves from discipleship are deceiving themselves. I don't need to follow. I'm forgiven. And that's self-deception. Um, as, as he continues, we therefore simply have to try to understand grace and discipleship again in correct relationship to each other. We can no longer avoid this. Our church's predicament is proving more and more clearly to be a question of how we are to live as Christians today. Uh, Roman, and I share Romans 6, 1 through 4, says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as we're baptized into Christ Jesus, we're baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Um, you know, it is a call to discipleship to turn from it. Um, and uh, I believe this is the conclusion uh, of chapter one. Um, where Bonhoeffer presents sort of his own uh, his own blessed verses, and so I call them Bonhoeffer's Beatitudes. And Bonhoeffer writes, "Oops, <laughs> Bonhoeffer writes nothing because I just made it disappear." But here we go. Um, blessed are they who already stand at the end of the path on which we wish to embark and perceive with amazement what really seems inconceivable that grace is costly precisely because it is pure grace, because it is God's grace in Jesus Christ. Blessed are they who by simply following Jesus Christ are overcome by this grace, so that with humble spirit they may praise the grace of Christ, which alone is effective. Blessed are they who in the knowledge of such grace can live in the world without losing themselves in it. And following Christ, their heavenly home has become so certain that they are truly free for life in this world. Blessed are they for whom following Jesus Christ means nothing other than living from grace and from whom grace means following Christ. Blessed are they who in this sense have become Christians for whom the word of grace has become merciful. And um, like I said, that's our last slide here. So I'll stop sharing the screen there we are and um that's that's more or less all i have in terms of uh going through it we're gonna we're gonna examine more of bonhoeffer's work uh in the study to come and um i i just i just say that my motivation in sharing this is is not to separate or divide us as christians but to encourage people to not be afraid to follow uh, the Lord, and to answer the call of discipleship on your life. Um, my testimony is that uh, I, I was, I was a, a denominational Christian growing up, uh, a cultural Christian, if you will. And um, basically, I, I was a sinful person in that, in, that, in that context. I wasn't sure if I believed or not. Um, I was really interested in the fact of whether or not I was baptized as an infant because I was taught that that might be the only thing that could save me, uh, one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 
um, because of that, my licentious life of sin and worldliness, uh, I more or less became an atheist in my early adulthood, um, got involved with drugs and alcohol and uh, sexual morality of all sorts, um, basically had a period of brokenness, sort of repented, came back into a denominational church, um, had a personal tragedy, gave up on religion altogether, and walked into error. Um, basically in, into depression, uh, further drug addiction, uh, and broken relationships, and uh, Buddhism. And um, it was in that context of, of living outside of the faith that um, I got the call of discipleship. I got the call, the gospel call, um, where I heard a radio message, because uh, I had given up on church entirely. I heard a radio message that told me about the grace of God and the love of God, and how I could be forgiven simply by, by putting my faith in Jesus Christ. And, and like I said, I was immature at first and just rejoiced over the fact that I wasn't going to hell like I, like I knew I was going to, um, and that, um, that God loved me, and he forgave me. And I basked in that forgiveness for years and years and lived a licentious life uh, in it, uh, tried to follow the Lord the best I could, read the word of God because I felt the call. And as I did that, I felt more and more convicted by the word of God to turn from my sin and to live a surrendered life uh, of Christian discipleship. Um, through that, I went to recovery. I started doing recovery ministry, um, went on mission trips, uh, proclaimed the gospel, went to Bible college, got a, a Bible college degree, um, and basically led ministry for years and years and years uh, got like free of drugs alcohol and sexual immorality um, and then I felt led to get my master's in Christian uh, Christian counseling started a freedom in Christ uh, ministry uh, through uh, well community freedom ministry from freedom in Christ ministries uh, where I became uh, a teacher of, of Dr. Neil Anderson's work from Freedom in Christ uh, work, uh, which is uh, the picture of the darkness, the bondage breaker, Freedom in Christ are all available on our podcast and our uh, our site uh, and our YouTube channel uh, for anyone to check out. As Peter gives the thumbs up, that's where Peter came from. He's a graduate of a Freedom in Christ course that I've done um, on on Zoom, uh, basically that I do now nationally uh, on Tuesday evenings. Um, and so that's my story. I know what a life of Christian discipleship does. The grace of God is amazing, but uh, it calls us to follow the Lord. And when we do that and we surrender to him, we can resolve our personal and spiritual conflicts, uh, walk away from our sin and, um, and live a life of peace, love, and joy. Um, that's, our, that's my push for discipleship is because... Um, it's powerful. Uh, it's, and, and it's not discipleship. It's our relationship with God as he encourages us to become the people that he created us to be. Um, and so that's, that's tonight's thing. Um, Peter, do you have any, uh, any comments in regards to uh, what you read in chapter one that you'd like to share or, or anything in general? Um, I don't have anything specifically. Um, you know, I wrote down some notes. Uh, I, I want to read a few more chapters before I say anything specifically. Um, but what I would say is any, um, any grace that we hold in our lives in which nothing happens afterwards, you know, there's no change. That's not grace. You know, uh, grace, you know, or you talk about how God is a fire, um, you know, in the Bible, he's called uh, a consuming fire. Yeah. If you touch it, you will be burned, but thankfully you'll be burned in the positive direction of, of your life following Jesus and discipleship. So, right. but I, I still want to just hold off on any particular comments because I, I still maintain there's a difference between salvation and discipleship or the gospel and law distinctions. So I, I would refrain before I make yeah. any particular comments. Yeah, it's, right it's, it's, uh, it wasn't it's sort of an, ambi an ambitious thing because I love the book, but it's, it's, it's hard to, um, when, when, you, when you study, when you read Bonhoeffer, you're impressed, but then you're like, what do I do with this? And, and, it's, and it's so nuanced um, 
that he acknowledges like you think he's going one way and then he'll he'll acknowledge what you thought wait a minute you know like like you think you know where he's going but then he'll acknowledge that um he's not pushing us towards extremism necessarily either um because you would think cost of discipleship do everything the word of god says and do it literally and and everything like that and and in the next chapter you know he'll he'll talk about well in upcoming chapters he talks about um you know how the word of god you know certain people like the rich young ruler are told to do certain things but it's not necessarily a call on everyone and if we did do it that would sort of be legalism so um you know it's 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 difficult to to take it apart because i don't want to criticize it but uh you know i'm not here to sell it either i i'm i'm, I'm here to um to to share it with people um so they can understand what he you know why it's considered a modern crash the classic of christianity because because the words are good and um i mean there definitely has to be a a, a new emphasis on discipleship in the church absolutely you know and and, and that's what i hear more and more um you know even and in the big non-denominational churches there's an emphasis on small groups and um you know getting together uh, together to disciple uh, each other because they realize yeah. that um um there's easy, easily can be uh they can easily be criticized for being consumerist um you know but you know again it's really i i always I always look at discipleship as God's individual call on your life and an invitation to discover what you, what you will. And um, I say our, our Christian life doesn't have to be complicated, um, but it shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't look like, it shouldn't look like there's nothing to it at all. Um, you know, I, and, and it's difficult because of that balance between ultra grace and legalism and um everything in between um the more you follow the lord the, the the more you sort of separate from the world but we're not necessarily supposed to be separatist we're supposed to be in the world sharing the love of christ sharing sharing the um the goodness of god and uh to encourage people and and that's it really i i i want to encourage people because there's something here you know there's there's life here there's peace here um you know as a as as a person who has a degree in christian counseling i discovered that um christianity holds the keys to you know life everlasting but um to peace on earth <laughs> and goodwill towards men um that we can we can take um uh, take what christ tells us about ourselves and about um and uh, and about you know if we if we apply his teachings to our lives uh, we take care of depression we take care of low self-esteem we take care of anxiety we take care of our sin um the simple realization to, to to think that you know some things are impossible with man but all things are impo are possible with god mm. that we can actually be free uh, of certain things um and last night my uh discipleship freedom in christ class i was talking to the men and um, I said, you know, one of the, obviously the thing I always share is the, the, one of the biggest lies the enemy tells us is that something is impossible. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know, it, we, it, within the church, there's a problem of uh, people stating to Christians, you know, Christians telling other Christians, well, you suffer from depression and you'll always suffer with that. You'll just have to do your best to cope with it. And there's no emphasis on healing um uh, without you know there's no faith that you could be healed um cognitive therapists have more faith than some christians that you know they'll give you cognitive therapy exercises to change your thoughts to change your yeah. emotions and some cognitive therapists like uh, uh david burns in his feeling good book uh basically challenge uh modern modern psychiatry basically and their their, their proliferation of drugs um to just change your thoughts and you'll change your emotions and you'll change your behaviors well for the christian we can we can change our thoughts and our emotions but there's a other aspect to it the aspect of the spirit and um you know god's with us and god can help us 
And I pointed out to the guys last night, I'm like, if there's regular people that don't have this problem, and we're a Christian, we too <laughs> cannot have this problem um, through, with the power of God in our lives. Certainly, you know, if, if someone who's walking outside of faith can be free of this problem or not have this problem, why would we suffer from it? Why could we not be set free? And, um, you know, uh, what I'm pushing for is freedom in Christ. Um, that's why I'm part of that ministry. Um, because I, I've lived it. I've experienced it. I've come to the end of the search. The conclusion is we can be set free. Um, the presupposition of we can't be set free, that's easy. I don't have to try. You know, I'm forgiven, so that's all I need. I don't need to be set free. What's freedom in Christ? I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, I'm forgiven. I'm going to heaven. That's all that matters. You know? Well, God's calling us to do more. And, and um, you know, all, you know, the Bible, read the Bible, it'll convict you. Read all the epistles. It, it directs you to turn from sin. You know, uh, in, in 1 John, um, you know, it admits, 1 John 1, 7, 8, 9, basically admit that there are none without sin, no, not one. And, you know, basically it directs us to confess our sins, to be cleansed and be made righteous. And that, you know, if we say we don't sin, we, we lie. But the entire rest of that epistle is all about turning away from the darkness. <laughs> um, why would John do that if we couldn't have victory? Um, as I pointed out in my blog um, this week, possibly today, um, yeah, this morning, um, you know, we were told to be made perfect, be, be perfect. But in that passage from the Sermon on the Mount, God's talking about loving your enemies. And then he says that it's not about law keeping. It's about showing the love of God towards up to others. In that sense, we should be perfect. And if you look at that phrasing, the Greek word for perfect is teleos, uh, whatever. Uh, I'm not a Greek scholar. So if the, uh, if the uh, pronunciation is off, I, I apologize. But teleos, basically one of uh, the definitions for that is to be complete. And the common English Bible of this uh, translation of that same verse says to be complete as God, complete in your love as God is complete in his love for others. And it's like, well, that's sort of a different take as opposed to I thought I had to be perfect and beat myself up like Martin Luther in the, in, in the monastery um, to try to be perfect. Um, no, um, and, and the, the other verse I shared was from James, I believe it's 417, that says for someone to know what to do is right, uh, but who doesn't do it, for him and his sin. So here we go, guys. We can repent of our overt sins like lying and you know and 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 things like that, adultery. We can stop that, but what we'll probably never do is do everything that is good. Uh, when we, you know, we're we're only human. Um, we'll have blind spots, so we may fall into other sins, but we can have. Uh, we're always going to have sin in the fact that we don't do what is, we don't always do what is right, what is good. Um, so it's, like I said, a, a sin of omission or commission or, you know, basically committing it or not doing it um, will come up as sinners every time. But as Colossians tells us, in, in we are complete in him, meaning in Christ. And so we are complete in Christ. And um, you know, when we when we study the word, when we understand who we are in Christ uh, and start to to renew our mind with the word of God and start to live out our faith, things change. And, um, you know, we can make we're never going to be perfect like Jesus, but we are complete in Christ and we can make progress as we go from here to there on this path of Christian discipleship. And so. Uh, that's what we're here to do, and that's why we're here to encourage a life of discipleship, and that's what it's about. I'm not here to discuss the theological nuances of the different, you know, the Bonhoeffer system of theology. Um, you know, I'm not here to, to, to put on a, a big debate between why we should you know, not preach cheap grace or why we should, you know, you know, how we shouldn't even bring that up because we don't want to discourage people from discovering grace because grace is amazing. 
Um, but, you know, we have to realize, you know, and whenever I hear someone um, uh, debate the question of cheap grace, I, I, I ask, did they read Bonhoeffer's description? Is that what they're going on or are they just sort of assuming um, that people, uh, Bonhoeffer is trying to push people to the law? I don't think he's necessarily doing that. Um, he's, he's pushing us to have a, a relationship with Christ who would lead us. And what would Christ lead us into? Holiness. So yeah, obedience. And uh, there'll be more of that in the next chapter for sure. Um, well, uh, Mike Thomas, we, we thank you for checking in and listening, brother. We're, we're with you. Uh, like I said, I am recording this, so I can totally understand if you want to stay silent or um, stay blacked out. Uh, but we do appreciate you coming, Mike. Uh, there he is. And Mike's driving anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah you gotta love zoom you never know i hope the 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 um the car trouble for your son worked out you know um give us a thumbs AAA's up already, the triple a's already picked it up we've already dropped it off we're headed back all right brother all right well i'd say stay safe uh i'm gonna upload this on our uh on our on our podcast uh and on our youtube channel mt for christ 24 7 and so um, for tonight, we're going to call it a night, uh, basically an hour and a half into it. That's pretty long for a YouTube video. So I hope people forgive and uh, I hope they enjoy what we put together. Um, and uh, if you like what you see, subscribe to the YouTube channel, subscribe to our podcast, check out our, uh, our blog on uh, mtforchrist.org, um, get connected with Freedom of Christ Ministries. Um, and uh, if you join a men's group, I'll probably be the teacher. Um, and uh, as Peter and Michael uh, can attest, um, you know, basically it's a worthwhile ministry and, uh, you know, following the Lord can, you know, lead to our freedom. So from uh, MT Clark and uh, our friend Peter James and Mike Thomas, um, we say thank you uh, for, for listening. Thank you for watching. And uh, we're just going to close with a quick prayer and a sign off. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for another day in your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for the work of Dietrich Bonhoeffer that encourages us to follow you and to answer the call of, of, of discipleship and to um, not treat your grace cheaply and to just use it as a covering for our sin and to stay the same as we were when we didn't even know you, Lord. Um, we want your grace to be amazing, that it comes into us, chains our hearts and minds to make us want to follow you and make your love uh, known to all the world. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We love you. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right, guys. God bless you all. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in or listening. Uh, we appreciate your faithfulness. Stay true uh, to Jesus Christ and make him known throughout the earth. And tonight we're going to stop the recording right there.